last time. So, all right, we're recording. There you go. Um, let me just double check a few things here first. Okay, we are definitely recording. Cool. All right, so did everybody get the project as a PDF to load up as a background image? Cool. Can you guys turn your computers towards me so I can just uh, take a look at how that went? All right, I see it here. Let's got it done. Yep, yep, nice. Cool. So it looks like you guys have this like weird jigsaw puzzle, this kind of like uh, this ant nest that's going on. All right. At any point, did it start getting frustrating that like the lines were very thin and it's hard to see it? Absolutely. Okay. So, you know, there's a couple things that you can do. You can alter that image. So like you could take that image to Photoshop and you could like gray it out more to make it more, you know, like you could change the color. You could make it, you can't make it more transparent because AutoCAD isn't going to understand how to look at a transparent image, but you could make it more monochromatic if that was helpful. But the first thing I'm going to bring in, I'm going to import the PDF into this new file, which is what we were doing on Tuesday. So I'm going to select that file and bring it in so I can get to be in kind of the same situation as you guys. Let's not import my W2. Nobody wants to look at that. So I'm gonna open up just this file for a moment here. Um, if you're bringing in something that has like multiple layers to it, it's still gonna have that. But we said that what we needed to do was rasterize the image and we wanted to bring it into the current layer and just say, okay. And what I wanna show you guys is that you can literally do that to any PDF image, right? You can bring in absolutely any PDF image that you want. So we have this one here. Um, all of your projects come in at kind of a default size and scale, and they also all come in at the zero zero, which is over here. Okay. Oh, I know the other commands that we need to go over. Zoom. Zoom, which is not necessarily not necessarily uh, the pro the um, teaching program that we're on right now. Okay, so. Once I have this on here, I'm gonna just zoom in and I'm gonna do a little bit of what you guys are doing with the plan. So just typing in the typing in the information and kind of you know making a bunch of these. So the first question to answer is it's really frustrating having to type rectangle every single time, right? So check this out. Uh, spacebar and return or the enter button are the same thing in AutoCAD. Also the same thing in AutoCAD is right click. If you right click, it will bring up a series of instructions. So check this out. When I hit right click, it brings up this kind of auto command set of commands that are right here. So check this out. It says recent input. And so it literally will give me the list of the latest commands that I did. But if you just hit right click, it says repeat rectangle. So since I just did rectangle, so try that out for yourself right now. I can just literally right click and click again and I've immediately got rectangle. So what this allows me to do is that I can kind of build out some of these rectangles really quickly. Did anybody try, did anybody try ellipse? Anybody give ellipse a try? Yeah. Now, ellipse doesn't really have a big. Um, I mean, you can start. It's E L, but ellipse isn't. It's a command that has a few steps to it. So, Isabel, you had a question. Yes. So 
Because not every line deserves to be a polyline, but most do. But I wanted you guys to just get a sense of like how to get a bunch of lines down on the page first, but we'll go over what a polyline is in a minute. Um, so let me just try ellipse, and I just want to show you guys what ellipse looks like. I'm going to go over here into the black screen area so you can see it. So an ellipse has to have two points. It needs to happen along an axis, and an ellipse has two control points to it. So you have to sh you have to give it its width, and then you have to give it kind of the depth that it has to it. So in order to get an ellipse, you have something like this. Once you have the ellipse, we did start to go over this, which is that you can select anything once you've created it. If you click on it again, you can select it. We also went over the fact that you can do a crossing boundary going from the right to the left, which is a, um, a dashed line crossing boundary. It shows up as green. That means anything it crosses and touches, it will select. And a crossing boundary where you select off where there's nothing and you go to the right is a closed loop crossing boundary. It shows up as blue. And only the things that are entirely within that square will be selected. So since the ellipse is not entirely within that square, it's not selected, or I can just click on the ellipse. Now, I can alter the ellipse dynamically right now by stretching it to what I want it to be, like this. I can also move the center point around. So there's a graphic interface. I don't even have to type the move command. I can just grab it and move the whole thing by grabbing its toggle right there. All right. I love this about AutoCAD because it teaches you that there's always one, two, three ways to do something. Okay. You can also make an ellipse by creating a circle. But then you can grab that circle and you can use the stretch command. Now, stretch is STR. But you, do you guys see how there's a graphic interface right up here in the corner? So if you forget some of those basic commands, they're literally right here, and it'll play a little demonstration for you about what the stretch command does. So check this out. Let's try to stretch this circle. So we've already selected it, and now I can grab it, and I can stretch it up and down. I can also use a circle to build an ellipse. So if I like that circle, I can use that to build out the ellipse so that they're matched. So I can start to build up those shapes. But right now I'm doing everything by eye. So you guys noticed that things were getting, uh, as I called them sticky, but Andre, you were saying like, as you got close to things, as you started to get a lot of lines, it wanted to like grab your mouse to move to other things. Yep. And that's exactly what it is. It's called snap and, um, or it's called, it's called both snap or O snap. And what it does is it's trying to assist you by connecting to things. So let me just, let me build some shapes out here in the, uh, in the verse here. Um, a couple of things that are true in Photoshop are true across a lot of web interfaces. So like if you want something to line up, so for example, I'm doing, I'm just copying and pasting rectangles right now. So I can do it by eye, but that moves them around a little bit. If you want them to be precisely aligned, just hold shift. Now when I hold shift, do you see how they're automatically in alignment with each other? Now, obviously, you guys already know that the best way to keep these all aligned would be to do the array command. Because then not only does it give me as many as I want, they're linked to each other, and I can add or subtract them as I see fit. So we have all of these images, and there's a few things that are going on right now. So we can set the computer to, I want you guys to type this in, type in O, S, and you'll see it. The command is O snap, as in O snap. I didn't mean to do that, right? The O snap command is uh, a powerful friend. Do you guys remember when we were doing Photoshop and I told you guys about the uh, Spider-Man tools? Magic wand is a Spider-Man tool. Alec, what did that mean? 
with great power comes great responsibility. The O snap command is really, really powerful. Sometimes you want to turn it on and sometimes you don't want to turn it on. So for example, if you're Spider-Man, if you have watched the Spider-Man movies, all three eras of Spider-Man, when Spider-Man first becomes Spider-Man, he starts sticking to everything. Currently, we are in that stage, okay? Basically, Spider-Man needs to learn when he wants to stick to stuff and when he doesn't want to stick to stuff. So I want you guys to click on O Snap, and it's going to bring up this interface. And I want to, I want to walk you guys through the ones that are helpful, the ones that are helpful sometimes, and there are a few that are incredibly dangerous. They exist as options. Eventually, you're going to click on it. It's going to create a headache for you, and you need to not do that. Okay. So, first things first, when we talk about a line and it has components that we could snap to, the endpoint, what's the endpoint? We have a line. Yeah. So yeah, it's right. It's just where the line, it's just where the line stops. The midpoint is a really easy, right? This feels really rudimentary. And this is how AutoCAD, this is how AutoCAD lulls you into a false sense of uh, security, right? You're like, okay, endpoint, I got it. Midpoint, I got it. Center, I got it. Now, if you're a line, the, the midpoint and the center, same thing, okay? But if you're a circle, it's got one center. If you're an ellipse, it has two centers, all right? Node, quadrant, fantastic. You're not really gonna use them, don't worry about it. Intersection, where two lines cross, all right? That's, those all make perfect sense. It doesn't even actually have to be a line, right? It could be where a line crosses across an arc. It could be where two arcs cross across each other. Intersections can be really helpful to snap to. Extension can be tricky. So <clears throat> what do you guys have turned on default right now when you turn on those snap? Endpoint? Endpoint's checked. Is center checked? Is midpoint checked? No. Okay, go ahead and try clicking on midpoint. Is intersection checked? Okay, now I want you guys to click uh, perpendicular. Perpendicular should be checked as well. Now, tangent makes sense, right? You guys know what a tangent is? You have a circle, right? You have any curve, a line that intersects that curve at one point and only at one point is its tangent. That makes sense. Okay, now here's the really dangerous ones. Nearest and apparent intersection. Nearest is difficult because it immediately makes, makes your, your um, cursor stick to absolutely whatever is the closest. And unless you absolutely want to stick to that thing, it's a real pain in the butt. But the one that's dangerous, the one that gets you into a lot of trouble, the one that will cause a systemic error is apparent intersection. And I'm going to show you guys why right now. So just do me a favor. Stop looking at your computers and just look up here for the moment. See where I did these ellipses? I'm going to draw a rectangle around it. I'm going to draw a line around it. Okay, I have a density of lines that exist here, okay? I'm gonna zoom in. Now, we're in a computer program. And remember guys, the, these lines actually have, these lines are all equations. These lines do not actually exist, they're just equations, right? So the ellipse exists as the equation that you may have learned in geometry or trigonometry for this to exist. So watch what happens as I zoom in. Uh, actually, let me make, first let me make another ellipse. Let me make a circle. So I'm gonna make a circle, I'm gonna make another circle. Okay, I'm gonna ask Gracie in the back row, is there an intersection here? There is. Do all the circles intersect each other? Do all the circles intersect each other? Yes, okay. At this level of detail, it does. It looks like they do. Now, here's the first mistake that I can make is I can zoom out, right? So I'm mouse wheeling out. Now, some of you guys might have those mouse wheels, which are really nice where they, um, they kind of click. As they, mine is freewheeling. So if I do this, a chew, 
It just keeps freewheeling. And now, where's my drawing? Oh, crap, right? I don't know where my drawing is. First thing we can do to get a hold of that is zoom. And the, the uh, command for zoom is Z. So we're going to zoom. And you can see down here, it says all center dynamic or extents. We want extents, EX. Zoom. Come on. There we go. Z space E space. Again, so like, it looks like there's nothing in this file right now, right? Zoom space E space. Here we are back. Okay. Now in this view, Gracie says that all of these exist. So, so I I just zoomed out basically to the moon. All right. Like we're zooming out. 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 I'm I'm tens of thousands of miles away. Zoom. The other thing that we can do, check this out, Gracie. I'm gonna zoom in, I'm gonna zoom in. Oh, and you can see that that circle does intersect both of these, but do you see how that one, those two circles don't intersect? When we zoom out far enough, it looks like those circles intersect, but when we zoom in, they don't intersect. Now here's the other dangerous thing that I can do. I can draw a rectangle that's so tiny. This rectangle is, uh, Jack, can you read what the dimensions of that rectangle are? Which means it's uh, that rectangle is so small that it is zero inches by zero inches big. How might that be problematic, Zoe? Like it doesn't exist. And yet it does exist, but it doesn't exist, right? And I can check this out, guys. I can keep zooming in. And you know what I can do? I can build another one. So what are the dimensions of that rectangle? So that, but hang on, which rectangle is smaller? But they're both zero inches by zero inches big. This gets really confusing, right? Do you guys see how this gets? Get? So one of the problems with AutoCAD is that you can zoom out too much and you can zoom in too much, all right? So if we turn on O-Snap, and we click apparent intersection. That means that from where Gracie was sitting, where it looked from where you were sitting, and this is the correct answer, it looked like they intersected, it will try to place a line. But then when we zoom in and they don't actually intersect, but you won't know that, so you'll click because it seems like it snapped and it made sense, but it doesn't. Never, ever, 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 ever click apparent intersection, okay? And if you see anybody doing that, now some students get frustrated and they're like, I just want it to snap. It looks like it intersects. Don't do it. Don't do it. I'm looking at Alan. I'm looking at you. Good. Excellent. All right. So we don't want to have that selected. The other thing that you don't want to do, I'm going to actually delete these right now. You don't want to draw something that's so tiny that you'll never be able to find it again. And you don't want to draw something that's so big that it's gonna make your file huge. You can literally draw one foot equals one foot to the moon. Don't do it, okay? All right, so now that we've got this, I'm gonna just add some more lines here. Now, you guys realize as you were drawing with those lines, they, they are separate from each other. So you can kind of like move them around. I'm gonna to introduce to you guys another type of line and it's called a poly line or a poly dimensional line. So check this out. Type PL and you'll see that it says Pline. That stands for poly line. Where did I put it? Where did I put it? line. This is going to be a little bit different. Now, watch Isabel's face as she tries to do the polyline. Do you guys see what happens is as you start drawing, it keeps drawing a line. So far, everything's the same. When you hit spacebar or escape to get out of the command and you go back to select it, check out what happens. It selects the whole thing. 
at once. Instead of connecting, instead of grabbing each of the pieces one at a time, it selects the entire line. And you can even make it be a closed shape, which means that you have it connect to itself. Now, there's some really cool features to this. For example, since these are math equations, at some point, you guys, I don't know, did you guys have to use like a graphing function on a computer program or, or one of those like big calculators that looks like it's the size of an iPad? iPad? Did you guys ever have to answer a question in math class where they're like, how much area is underneath this curve? Okay, so the reason why AutoCAD exists in the first place is literally to answer that question. So basically they were like, instead of like making Alec do it, can we make the computer do it? So one of the things that I can do right now is I can type properties and it's gonna bring up this, this is gonna tell me the set of properties that this line has. And if you look in here, we go down right here, it says area and it's the amount of area that exists within that place. So like AutoCAD was never intended to be used by architects. It's just that engineers realized that engineers were trying to compute like how much area is under a curve, how much area when these complex shapes go together. And then the engineers were like, oh, we could use this to draw drawings and build machines. And then the architects are like, the engineers are using this cool program to draw drawings. We want to use it to draw drawings. And then somebody eventually was like, we could use this to design a computer game. And thus like Frogger and Tetris were born. Now, the cool thing about this is later on in your architectural careers, you can use that polyline function to start to figure out how much square footage is in your project. As a matter of fact, I believe you guys are working on a project right now where you have some square footages, right? So if your design is a square, it's easy to figure out what the square footage is. But how many of you have a plan that might be a strange shape? Yeah, I bet there's a few of you. And to catch you can use this to do that. So here's what I want you guys to do. Grab one of the jigsaw puzzle city blocks that you already have. I'm gonna zoom into this shape that I have right here. And adjust it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna adjust this circle so it's matched up with the other circle that I have right here like this. And what I want you guys to do, once you get it to kind of match, I want you to draw a polyline around it. So that's PL, and you're just going to trace by snapping to the intersections or the endpoints of those lines. So make one of those jigsaw puzzles, which is currently made out of five or six or seven different lines, and use the P line to go all the way around it to make it one shape. So for example, here I have, here I have, right, this is made up of a strange Shape, I'm just gonna say P line. I'm gonna go like this. I'm gonna go one, two, three, four, five. Hit space when I'm done. And then I can grab it and I can move it over here. The other thing that's interesting is that you can use P line to make a closed shape when you don't even have a closed shape. So for example, you guys can see right here, I'm using the endpoints to connect it all together. So you're gonna have another one, all right? Now, right now, your desk, your, your um, drawing should look like kind of a funky jigsaw puzzle. And mine just looks like a mess of a jigsaw puzzle. So we need to introduce some other things to try to keep our life a little bit more organized, all right? Um, what do we do when we're hand drawing to make our drawing be more organized or make more sense? What kind of, what kind of lines do you guys add to start planning out how you're going to make a drawing? Hannah. Construction lines. Now we can do that same thing here. Are all your lines, let me ask you guys another question. How do you know what a construction line is in an analog room? Line weight? Yep. How do you guys know what a construction line is here? We can't see line weights, so we need to do color. Yeah, we need to do color, we need to change it somehow. Okay, so we have not 
done any layers yet. Get this out of the way. We've not done any layers yet. So what we're now going to introduce is we've done polyline, we've done ellipse, we've done zoom, we've done stretch. Oh, hang on. We've talked about the fact that there's different kinds of. But now let's go in and talk about layers. So if you type layer, which is just LA, you'll get this interface. All right. Um, and if you don't want it, you can, you know, grab it and pull it down over here. And I'm going to get rid of it. I'm just going to close it because it also layer because layer is used so much. It also exists up here in the upper right hand corner. And all of the layer information is right here as well. But I'm just going to go into this. I'm going to type in LA for layer. And we're going to get this. OK, now right now there is one layer and it's called zero. OK. Um, we are going to add some standard layers right now. And here's the layers that we want to have. The first layer that we don't get to keep is called layer zero. Okay. The next layer that you're going to interface with, with any firm, is called death points. This is always a non-printing layer. And since you guys use construction, you should use a layer that's called construction line. Now, from here on out, the way that this is going to, the layers that you're going to have depends on the office that you're in. An interior architecture firm and a landscape architecture firm are probably going to have, the landscape architecture firm is probably going to have layers for different types of trees, right? The interior architecture firm might not have that, okay? Um, what kind of layers do we think we want to have for our imaginary city? Yeah. Roads, okay. Although... If we draw roads first, have a horse to do that. there's danger there, right? So we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna put conditions on that, right? What other ones? Yeah, building. All right. So these are things that we can see that are visual. But what else? Do we have? I think about think about what you as a class. Identify as being really important in terms of when you were making maps, when you were drawing stuff. You guys have a lot more expertise than just me. Oh, monuments. Yeah. Density? Ooh, okay. There we go. I'm gonna leave that here for now. Okay. Now, um, this layer list, I'm gonna show you guys how to make a new layer next, right now. But you can, can you guys see how this list could get really long? Imagine of all of the things that go into making a building, like hot water, cold water, uh, electrical lines, different types of windows, different types of building materials, different finishes. Uh, different pieces of structure. This list can get very long very fast, okay? So the other thing I'm gonna suggest that you guys do is load a number that goes along with the layer, okay? So for construction lines, let's make it zero, zero, zero construction. So let's, I'm gonna show you guys how to do a layer right now. So we're gonna go over here and let's check this out. If you look at this, there's a stack of layers that are right here. And if you hover over top of them, it'll give you options. So check this out. It says new layer, Diego. 
What does it look like? Oh, because you are on the Macintosh. Diego, come on right down here on the computer so that I can see it. All right. So when you type LA, you're going to get layers, layers here like this, but also All right, so what we're going to do is that you can also okay. so the other thing that you guys can do. So does everybody have this besides Diego? Does everybody have this? Okay. So right click and it also says new layer. So there's so again, every time in AutoCAD, there is a graphic interface. So that means there's a button somewhere. And you can type, you can you can click and get something. So here it is, new layer. It should come up like that. Triple zero space construction line. I'm gonna work on this in one of the maybe one of the computers here. Yeah. We're looking for the button that looks like this. the star and it doesn't have it yet. All right, I'm gonna need to keep on going though, okay? Show layer list, there it is. We're getting close. There it is. The button even looks different, but there it is. Okay. You're gonna want to learn the the this wrapper method though. Okay. I know it hurts. We'll talk about it more. All right. So, guys, do you have your construction line layer? Yeah. Question. All right. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna set the line type. Now there's information on the property of the line type here. What color should a construction line be? What's a good construction color? Orange? Yeah, you're right. I always make I always make my construction lines orange. You can make it whatever color you want, but since we're all going to be working in a class together, let's make it triple zero construction line and let's make it orange. That way, whenever you guys see orange, you will know that it is a construction line. Okay. We're going to make it continuous and we're going to set the line weight to be default. That's it. We're not going to mess around with any other piece. Okay. When you're done with that, let's make another layer, layer. All right. So again, you can hit the button or you can click this and say new layer. And let's do uh, layer 10 and we'll call it neighborhood. All right. And let's make it, what color should the neighborhoods be? Magenta. Magenta is the color of the neighborhood. Okay. Now there are some lines that are really hard to read. So for example, getting into shades of gray, it's very difficult to differentiate the different shades of gray. One of the reasons why AutoCAD colors are so kind of multi-floral in the way that they are, like they're very rainbow colored is because it's easier to discern the differences in them. If you go for a wide difference in color range, if you just do like my drawing is shades of light blue, it's gonna be very hard to figure out what's what. Now, if you are somebody that has like half the members of my family, red, green, color blindness, maybe don't make stuff red and green. You can use a color palette that works for your uh, color scheme. All right, so I'm gonna select this out. Now we haven't drawn anything yet on these layers. So what we now need to do is set 
the active layer that we're drawing on. Now in Photoshop, do you guys remember when you were trying to edit and cut out stuff, you had to activate the object that you were gonna work on? The same thing happens here. So I want you to go up to this corner. Diego, it's gonna be a little bit different for you. It's probably gonna be over here on this side of the screen. And there's a drop down menu and check it out. In that drop down menu, there is construction line. So what I want you to do is to click on that and that's gonna make it the active layer. And we're gonna say line. We're gonna say line and we're gonna draw something and you're gonna see, I'm gonna hold shift so that it stays straight up and down. And I'm just gonna give myself a, an array of construction lines. So that I have like a grid of construction lines. Come on down with your questions. All right, so stay here. All right, so as you guys are working, it's possible to do a few things. So watch this, you, you can adjust the interface. And the reason why this is important to know is because often students will adjust their interface without realizing it. So I can grab this, do you see how I just ripped it off of the ribbon up top? And now it's free floating out here. This just happened to Hannah. And I can even close this and then I'll get rid of it. I'm gonna dock it back up to here, okay? So immediately, the first thing, the first thing I want you guys to interface, when something starts happening and you're not sure what it is, for example, Diego, your question was, how do I make a new layer? Anna, your question was, how do I bring back the, uh, the ribbon, the toolbar, okay? So I have yet, I have yet in my 20 years of, in my 20 plus years of doing architecture stuff, I have yet, yet to open AutoCAD and not have a question about how to use it, okay? So losing your toolbar is something that happens all the time. And the answer is always slightly different in every newly updated version. So in 2017, I know where to go. But let's, let's here we go, how to restore. So yeah. There's different ways to do it. So hang on, first what I wanna show you guys is how to ask a question, because most of the time, right? If you're in class, we can figure it out. But if you're not in class, you're kind of frustrated. So do you guys see up here, you can type in a question. And I said, how to restore the toolbar? And I'm gonna hit enter. As long as you're connected to the internet, even if you're not, the FAQ is gonna come up, okay? And so lay ISO, clean screen, restore a dimension style, clean screen on, property selected, restore, restore custom settings, how to restore the classic workspace in AutoCAD 2015 and later. All of this stuff is here. This doesn't mean that it's going to 100%, but type it up in And Diego, I want you to do the same thing, but say how to make a new layer. And I want you to write it into that. The other way that you can get to this in any program, and this is gonna be really important when you go to Rhino next year, is to hit F1, right? So if you hit F1, it automatically takes you to the help screen. And that's for, Adobe products, that's for AutoCAD products, okay? Reset toolbar. Now, sometimes you might need to, you might need to kind of consider synonyms for the words that you wanna do. The last thing that I'm gonna show you, hang on, let me move this out of the way, is if you go up here, so home is gonna reset some of the, this ribbon, but actually this ribbon is gonna change every single time. If you select home, and then there's the lines down on it. Nope. All right, so you can go through the content. And what we're gonna look at is, I'm gonna do view. And then do you also have the lines down here? No. Oh, there It's definitely a button that you pressed. There it is, here it is. Okay, 
See this one? Oh, I should call it. Nice job. There you go. And then hit home. There we go. So, yeah. Yes. So, you can also, so the, to bring it down after you've gotten them, there you are. And you select the next layer. So, you just grab that button right there. It brings down this command, and now we're drawing in those construction layers. Okay. So, at this point in time, you guys should have the zero layer, which is what you drew all your homework in. You should have, ooh, you should have the triple zero construction layer, and you should have a magenta neighborhood layer. Please raise your hand if you have all those things, just so that I know. Yes? Okay. I just realized we need one more layer. Oh, by the way, remember you can type, what do you type to get to the layers? What do you type? What's the command? Let LA for layers. Hey guys, check it out. You can also just press this button right here. Like, there's always multiple ways to do it. I realized there's one more layer that we need to do because we didn't, we left Jack's question unanswered. So let's do one more new layer. Let's call it layer 90 and let's call it photo, um, let's call it map image. And let's make it brilliant green. All right. So wouldn't it be nice if you could turn off the photograph just to look at it without the photograph? Okay, cool, check this out. So here's what we're gonna do. First, we're gonna select it. Okay, we're gonna select the image, all right? And we can do this in a couple of different ways. What we're interested in is the properties of that layer. So we can select it, right click, and the properties shows up right here. Okay, that's one way that we can do it. We can type, we can literally type properties, but it's just gonna give us the properties of whatever, of everything. We can select it and type properties and it's gonna give us some of the information of that layer image. Okay, these are three different ways to get to it. The way that I'm gonna get into it is I'm gonna select it with a crossing box, right click and select properties. Now, all three ways that I just went over, you can, you can open properties and select it. You can select the thing and right click. You can select the thing and type properties. All of those ways work. So this is gonna tell us all the information about what this is right now, okay? It's telling us where it is, that's the geometry. It's telling us what the image is, um, and it's telling us what layer it's on, okay? So here's what we need to do right now. We're going to change the layer that it's on. So grab this right here. Do you see that information? All of this information is editable. So once you've got properties, again, let me do it one more time. I am going to select the image, right click, and hit properties. I'm gonna go up here, to what it says it's on layer zero. Now check this out. We can move it by grabbing it here and saying, move to that. See how it turned to green? Now, now that it's on the green layer, it actually has, I don't know if you guys can see this, it has a green outline. All right. Furthermore, I can do some other things to it. Remember we were saying like, if you wanted it to come in and, and be darker or grayer. So I drew with a bunch of white lines on top of a white piece of paper. There's no way for me to see it. Let's go in here, the properties. Let's move this out of the way. If you look here at the image brightness, I can adjust the image brightness. So I could say, what if we make image brightness 10? I can make it darker. I can make it lower contrast. I can fade it and I can say, okay, and check it out. Do you guys see what happened? My image? Let me do this one more time. I'm gonna hit undo, control Z. Now here, do me a favor. Here's another moment. Just look up to the screen to watch and follow along with what I'm doing. So I'm selecting the image. 
and I'm doing properties. So I'm right clicking, I'm going to properties. Now, since this is an image, not only can I edit what layer it's on, I can edit some of the image information. So I'm clicking on this here. And when I click this button, AutoCAD 2017 couldn't do this. Auto 2020, AutoCAD 2024 can. We're going to kick this button and it brings up, this looks almost like Photoshop, right? With the sliders. So look at this. We can make it darker. We can make it less contrasty and we can also make it fade out. All right. So watch what happens. Look here. I hit OK. All of a sudden, you can see all the white lines that I drew. I haven't actually changed the image. I could still go back and I could set everything to 50, 50, and zero. And it goes back to the way that it was. But if I wanted to draw over an image so that it was not as, not as strong, I can do that. So I want you guys to try that out with the drawing that you just brought in. So click on your map. Move it to a new layer and see if you can adjust the fade on it down a little bit. How's it going? What? You did it? All right. Are we good? Does it work? Does it show up better? Hannah? Come on down. All right. So while we're working on this, anybody have, you guys now have a bunch of neighborhood outlines that need to be on the neighborhood outline layer, right? Okay, so we could go through and select each and every one of these and then do properties for it. Can you guys appreciate, this is gonna take a long time to move this to, move this to the layer outline, right? Don't you wish there was a better way to do this? So now it's magenta. It's gonna take a long time to do that, right? How do you feel like you're digging in for a long monotonous piece of homework? Okay, so check this out. We could select most, we could select a lot of them at once. So if we select it, check this out. If you hold control, you can select multiple things at once. All right. And then we could change the layer by doing that. It's just going up here. We don't actually have to open properties. If you have something selected, it'll show you what layer it's on up there. And you can reset that layer by doing that. All right. The key is to make the different layers have different colors so you know that the change is taking place. Do you guys wish that there was an even easier way to do this? Because there is. Now, check this out. Jack downloaded a plot configuration file because he was really, he had high hopes for it. And it's still actually going to be useful for you, but not how you thought. Have you guys ever looked at a map and over in the corner of the map, there's like a legend and it tells you what they are? All right. So, over here, we want to draw. We want to draw some really tiny squares. I'm going to draw these little tiny squares, and on each square, I'm going to make that square one of the layers that we already have. So that's going to be the construction layer. This one's going to be the layer zero. This one's going to be layer neighborhood. We can even copy and paste these down. This one's going to be layer image. So they're all different colors. You see, I have just, and they're just going to be collected down there. We're going to just make a parking lot. As a matter of fact, I'm going to put them in a big rectangle so I know exactly where they are. That's going to be our legend, and we're going to keep a parking lot of them there. Now, there's another command called, and I wrote it down here, match properties. And I don't know whether you guys can see it. See the big button up here, match properties? The command is match prop. Click on that and read what it tells you in the command line. This is why I, this is why last class we spent so long going over the command line, okay? Because whenever you're not sure how a command should work, even if the animation isn't working, the command line is gonna tell you what to do next. So the command line says select source object. So right now we wanna paint a bunch of neighborhoods. So select the source object as the neighborhood and it'll turn into a paintbrush. And now watch what happens anytime you click on something. It will change its layer. So everything that you download, you can match its property by like painting and then painting it to be like that. So basically what you're doing is you're saying, hey, everything that looks like this, everything I click, make it look like this. Click, 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 click. And then you can hit escape to get out of that command, hit match property again, and say everything that you want to look like this. Paint, 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 paint. 
So you can move. So the reason why I had you guys draw so much is because the thing that takes the longest is actually drawing it. And then invariably, as you're drawing, things are you draw things on the wrong layer. Okay. So what you do is you use match properties. So what I want you guys to do right now is go into match properties and paint some of the neighborhoods into the neighborhood layer. Paint some of the construction lines into the construction layer. If there's a new layer that you want to add, add that new layer to your drawing. Ah, okay. New question, new question. Hannah has, Hannah has the image up on her screen and it keeps clicking to it. And the photograph, right? It, the photograph is sticky and there's, you have drawings that are hidden behind it and on top of it. Okay, first thing we can do is that you can click on this image and what we're gonna do is we're gonna have it, we wanna move the image to the background. So right now the image is showing up as an object that you can click. It would be nice if, because it keep moving on you. You keep selecting it, all, all right. So here's one of the things that we're gonna do. Guys, we're gonna go into the layer properties. This is probably happening to you. What we're gonna do in layer properties, there are a couple of options about what we can do to a layer. We can turn a layer off so that you can't see it anymore, all right? And that looks like, I'm gonna make this smaller. That looks like this, that's the light bulb. So when you turn a layer off, it literally turns it away. So turn off the current light, yep. When you do that, it turns it off. So let me just show you guys by clicking on the light bulb, do you see my image is coming on and off in the background? Now that's helpful because you might want to say, like you might realize that you have certain things that are on the wrong layer. So you do that by turning layers on and off so that you can find them. And I'm, I'll help you in just a minute. That's all right, that's all right. Um, the other thing that you might have is that you want the photograph up, but you want to stop selecting and moving it around because you realize that you have been drawing for a while and then you moved it. So that's locking the layer. So do you guys see the little padlock? Click it and it'll turn blue. When you lock the layer, you can still see it. All the lines are still there, but you can't change them. All right. Now, AutoCAD doesn't like it when you turn off the layer you're currently working on. It only wants you to turn off layers you're not working on. And if you match properties with something that has the layer already turned off, it's gonna give you a little warning. Just to, as a reminder, you're not in trouble, just letting you know. Locking your photograph layer is gonna be really important. Sometimes you're gonna to wanna to turn that layer off. So, from over here, first thing you wanna do, I'm gonna grab this, and we're gonna look at this part. Because, so we're gonna move it, and, Mm -hmm. the, uh, it's called match properties and it's right there. Yep, and it's this one right here, match properties. Now, there is a command that is called change layer. So there is a change layer command, but if you know match properties, you don't change layer. You when you back in the day when you type change layer, you had to know exactly what layer you wanted to change it to. But now with match properties, you just put everything down there like that, and you just paint it the way you want it to be. Super easy. Yep. Yeah. So. All right, let's go back into layer properties. In the layer properties, for every layer that you make, there's a ton of data, okay? So some of the data is, what is the line type? And let me just click on that. You can actually load different types of lines. So here's a dashed line, here's a dot line, here's a dot dashed line. You can actually load, check it out, you can load line weights. And if we do this, here's all these different line weights. Now, these line weights should look very familiar because they're the names of some of your, if you have a mechanical pencil, you might have a, a 0.5 mechanical pencil. If you guys have those little, um, 
those little thin pens, they probably are like 0 0.5, 0 0.05, 0 0.9. Same thing here, right? Those are the, those are the line weights. The line weights aren't set to show up when you're looking at an AutoCAD file, okay? Remember, I said we're going to go over line weights, but we're going to do it on Tuesday, okay? So in order to adjust the line weights, you need to have enough lines on the paper. Think about, think back to last semester when you guys first were drawing your shoes, when you were first drawing elevations. First, you get the lines on the page. Then you start making lines darker. Then you might start adding detail lines that are lighter. So the first thing we need to do is to get the lines down and to move them into the, into the layers that they need to be on. All right, so that's gonna be our focus for today. Um, what I'm not gonna do is do these adjustments, okay? Now, one last thing I wanna go over. This is very important. This is what not to do. So let me grab your attention because this is what not to do. So you can grab any individual object and you can change its individual properties. So if I look over here, and I select it, let's just look at the properties of this polyline. So this polyline is on layer zero, and you can see that in its properties, it says color by layer, line type by layer, line weight by layer, transparency by layer. You always want to have those settings that way. Check this out. I can change the color of this to green, but green is already a color of a layer that we have. What is green the color of, what, what layer is the color green? Our image, right? Now I've set it to green, but it's still on layer zero. Now, if I close this file and I give it to Jack, he's gonna be like, oh, what layer is that? And maybe he clicks on the image first. And he's like, oh, okay, all the image layers are green. So that must be on image layer green too. He's gonna be like, you know what? I'm done with that layer. I'm gonna turn it off. So I'm gonna. Click the, I don't have to go into the layer manager. I can do it right from this drop down menu. I can turn that off. Now Jack's really confused because all the image layers are green. That's what it says right there. But that's green and it's not turning off. And he's going to be like, what the hell's happening? Right? You always, always want to draw stuff. You want its properties to be by layer. Okay. You never want to change that information locally. You want to keep it always the same. So anything that's on the green layer is going to be green. It's going to be uh, images. It's all going to stay in that same family. And if it needs to change families, if it needs to go somewhere else, it needs to move layers, change colors, and do all those things that that new layer does. OK? OK, so let me go over the homework. The homework for Tuesday is that we are going to update our map. Okay, so everybody should have, uh, there's a couple of key components that we're gonna need to. And grab my Zoom, and I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can look at. Quick review, quick review. Here are the commands that we're Line, copy, erase, circle, rectangle, column. We went over arc, array, trim, extend, offset, fillet, camper, We went over order, which is actually a button that we can press. But we're just holding shift to make things really clear. We went over. We went over change layer and map properties. We went over how to make them work. We went over Felix polyline. And then we went over how to change a layer, how to change a color. We are going to go over how to do a line weight. We're going to do this on Tuesday. Alignment, we went over why things keep being sticky. So you can actually turn the O snap on and off. Oh, let me quickly, let me quickly just show you guys. There's a graphic way to turn O snap on and off. So let me share my screen. Yeah. 
sorry, down in the, down here, down in the lowest section. So you can go O snap, you can type in O snap. You can go into O snap right here and you can turn O snap on and off. So if you don't want it to snap to things, just turn like this is on something that's going to be in a cage for like 25 seconds really quickly. You can go down here, all right? And you can actually turn the grid on and off that's in the background. You can turn the snap on and off here. So that'll turn the snap on and off. But also, as you're floating across this, do you guys see it says F9? So you can also click F9 on the keyboard, and that will turn snap on and off. I recommend drawing with snap on all of the time, unless you're drawing something and it keeps sticking to stuff that you don't want it to stick to, then turn, turn snap off. And the reason why F9 is helpful is that if you're in the middle of a drawing command, hitting F9 should not interrupt that drawing command. Whereas you might have to escape out of the drawing command to click this button down at the bottom of the screen. Now, in AutoCAD, in the latest version of AutoCAD, in the ribbon down here along the bottom, they actually have some of the snaps here already. Now, one last thing about OSnap before I move on while I'm thinking about it. When I'm working in OSnap, it is not uncommon for me to come in here and turn off midpoint, turn off perpendicular, and turn off extension, and then five minutes later, come in and turn it back on. Because if you click too many of these, you can basically make it so sticky that you're sticking to everything. And sometimes you don't want, you just want to, you just want, you're trying to build the model so that these two things connect, but you don't need it to connect to anything else. So O snap is something that you end up spending a lot of time in where you're turning it on and off so that it's like, it's a little bit helpful. It's not helpful. I liken it to like driving with a GPS. It's kind of always nice to have the GPS on, but sometimes you don't pay attention to it. And sometimes, I don't know whether you guys do this. Sometimes I turn the voice on, on my GPS and sometimes I turn it off even while I'm driving on the same trip, okay? O-Snap is a lot like that. You guys look like you're about to have a question. No, okay. All right, so more things that we're going over. Now we're gonna go over layers. We're gonna do a breakout session where we go over some layers, but the homework. And your homework is going to talk and draw and update when you're going to go over we're going to have to go confirm and we're going to be remembering that we have to keep every time we turn in the layers and color select. As a group, we are going to work on that right now in a little breakout session. Over the weekend, you're going to have to complete the map of your individual city with that information. But more importantly, for the homework, you are going to add a couple of new layers of information that are interesting for you. All right. So, for example, I'm going to ask you guys to invent some zones, some cultural zones, some areas, some maybe uh, canals, maybe some delivery areas, historical and contemporary buildings. Ooh. Cool. Maybe uh, maybe some uh, nature walks. Maybe some yep in your city in the city that we're designing. So all right, we're gonna take a break. We're gonna take a break right now. So save your AutoCAD file. So you're gonna save it with today's date. So uh, you're gonna save it as twenty three oh three. What is it? What's today's date? The 29th? thirtieth. So you're gonna save it as twenty three oh three three zero. Last name, first name, imaginary city, update number two. And I want you guys to save it. Have, has anybody experienced AutoCAD crashing on them yet? Yeah, Alec? So you were working for a while and did AutoCAD just went and closed and all your work was gone? How long have you been working on it for? Like an hour and a half. All right, so guys, do you guys see that as I'm working my phone, keeps going off. Every time my phone alarm goes off, I hit control S, which is save. 
So my recommendation is, I don't know. Are you guys watching stuff on Netflix? What are you watching on Netflix right now? Outer Banks. How long is how long is an episode? An hour. At the end of every hour, it's safe. Any of you guys watching sitcoms, comedies, like Brooklyn Nine Nine? Brooklyn Nine Nine is lit. So I'm literally watching a. I'm watching the episode where. Uh, oh my gosh, what are their names? The the two old guys in the office. Um. No, not Holt. No, the two guys that are always a mess and eating food. Hitchcock, Hitchcock and the flat top. Anyway, so at the beginning of the episode, at the beginning of the episode, they put they put a Madillone's lasagna in the microwave and they hit 2130 because the episode is 21 minutes and 30 seconds long. Because the whole episode unrolls in real time. Anyway. If you're watching, if you're watching The Office, Friends, It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia, those episodes are about 20 to 30 minutes long. That's a great, like end of the episode, hit save. If you're listening to songs, make yourself a playlist, but do like do uh if you go into if you go into like YouTube or Spotify, do any of you guys not pay for Spotify so it does commercials after like every three songs? Every time you hit a commercial, hit save. Make a miniature, make a miniature playlist for yourself. That's just five songs long. When those songs, when those songs die out, hit save, or just set a timer on your phone, and when that timer sets off, hit save. There is an auto save feature in AutoCAD, um, but it's slightly different, and they keep changing it. It's a lot better to just save your own file again and again and again. This is it, what Alec. What happened to you? going to happen to everybody. So what was happening? You were just working along, right? Nothing seemed to happen, right? Like you didn't get an email, your computer didn't slow down. It just went and it just disappeared, right? It's going to happen to everybody. It happens on AutoCAD quite, free, quite frequently. So please save. I recommend saving between every 15 to 15 to 20 minutes, ideally every half an hour at a minimum. Okay. Diego. Yeah. All right, so when I go to save my, my file, here's what I do. I go down here, file, save as, all right? I'm gonna save it as a DWG file. Now, if you're working with other students, if you're working with other students that already had AutoCAD, I always tend to save my file to a lower edition of AutoCAD. So, the reason is, is that if you save it as a 2018 file, but Z like Zoe, let's say you're running 2017, right? I was running 2017 on my computer. It won't let me open that. So I save it down to an older file size. So instead of saving it as 2018, I usually save it something lower, like 2010. That way I know it'll work on the computer lab upstairs. So I'm going to hit it as that. And I always save with today's date. So the year is 23. The month is 03. The day is 30, and then I'm going to save it as Heart Andrew, imaginary city update number two. Now, it's a long file name, but the reason why is because we're going to keep, you're going to keep saving this, right? And we're automatically making a save so that you know what the day is that it's been used. Because if you, if you open a recent, you guys have done this, right? If you go back to open an old file, it's now at the top of your list for recent files. You wanna save what day it is. So if you write the date 2303.30, next year when you're working on your techno building technology two building section, all the stuff that you did when you were a freshman isn't gonna be in the way because it's gonna start with the file name 24. Okay. I am not a stickler about most things, but any digital files that I interact with need to follow this file naming structure. The reason is because I have six years of student files, right? So if I have a student that comes to me from last year, I can immediately type in 22 and I can bring up all the student files from 2022. 
in three years, you guys are going to go to Design Expo and you're going to need to design, you're going to need to pull your portfolio together. And the last thing you want to do is to try to dig through one file after another file after. Imagine you had to go back to your freshman year of high school and dig through all of the files that you can get back to during your freshman year. That would require you to remember exactly how you named that file. What was your science report named in April of freshman year? I have no idea. Do you remember how they're organized? Were you were you really organized about it freshman year? You were? Good. That's good. If you're organized and you always do it, it's great. But it means you've got lots of file structure. See, if you name it this way, then it doesn't matter whether it's organized. Or not. So almost all my stuff is in Google Drive. And in Google Drive, my photograph, all of my photographs are just organized by the date that they were taken on. So if I know when I was somewhere, I can look it up by the date. Like, that's great, but I mean, I have a file structure, but I also have a date structure. So if I need to know what I was doing in January of last year, I just type in 2201. There it goes, it brings up the recommendation letter that I wrote for Gaston Pombo last year. Boom. Like, I don't even have to, like, I bet you're organized, mine's faster. And if you're not organized, mine is way faster. So there you go. Um, for this class, we're gonna use this naming file structure. And the reason why I want your name to be included on it is because I like to exhibit student work. I like to put it out to uh, our social media. I like to print it out and put it, we're doing a brand new exhibition at the end of the semester that's gonna go up in a and We haven't done it for three years. I had this backlog of student, cool student drawings from the past three years. And part of what I wanna do is make sure that those students get credit, which is like, the there's no way to sign your name on a digital file other than to save it into the name of the file type. So even though it seems a little redundant that you're gonna have a lot of stuff with your name on your computer, if you ever save or send those files out to somebody, your name needs to be on them, right? Because you did the work. So I guarantee that if you're in an office, your office is gonna have a naming structure that main, maintains right there, proprietary control over that file and drawing. All right, so that's all important. Um, I wanna do this for a minute. We're gonna go back to, <clears throat> let me go with your sketchbooks out. Part one for the homework is to update the layers and file types that are in your that are in your um, AutoCAD file. Part two is gonna to be to add some of your own layers, but the more important part two is that you're gonna add layers, which we are gonna create as a class right now. And then bonus, bonus. Um, I'm very appreciative of the students that brought in different cities from kind of around the world. I think it was even, I think it's even more um, interesting when you bring in um, an urban environment. For this assignment, we want it to be an urban environment. But if it's a city that is of significance to you, either culturally or personally, whether it's important to your family, whether it's important to, uh, whether it's important to, um, you know, a place that you visited with friends or family, or a place where, you know, you're from, or your, or your family is from. So I just want to point this out to you guys. So I have, I have this map of Philadelphia. And all of the hearts are places that I have either lived or a project that I've worked on. So like in Google Maps, I was a really early adopter of Google Maps and I've done beta testing for Google Maps for like 15 years now. So um, I'm testing, I'm like right now, I just am started testing a new feature that they might roll out for Google Maps that allows you to kind of draw with your finger on it and then send it to people, which is a feature they should have had a long time ago. Um, but for example, if you zoom in here, Uh, this is a, I got to work on this project and over here, 
This is Rocky's house from the movie Rocky. And down over here on B Street, this is the house that my grandmother grew up in, which is kind of funny because like my dad never even visited the house that my grandmother grew up in, but it's here on the map. And actually, if I zoom out, I've got, I like, you know, every time I go places, if I find something that's interesting, I just update it on the map. So this map is kind of like autobiographical of like places I've been, things I find that are interesting. You can see that like I do a bunch of research in Spain. So these are all the places I've gone to in Spain, in Italy. Right? You guys know that like I have family in India. So I have family in Norway. I have family in Iceland. So these are like I've noted in all their houses and stuff. So like, I don't know, let's go on a tour. Do you guys ever want to know what an Icelandic city looks like? Let's check out what uh, Reykjavik looks like on the interior of Reykjavik. A lot of really, really square, really colorful houses. A lot of the historic houses in Iceland are all built out of like, they have metal cladding and the metal cladding comes in pre-painted colors. So there's like really blue, really red, really yellow. And they also use the metal cladding for their roofs. So you can see that the roofs are really colorful too. Uh, let's go to another city. Um, anybody want to name a city that we could go visit? Berlin, all right. Now Berlin's really interesting because Berlin is built underneath both Eastern and Western building practices. So if we go to Berlin and we start zooming in, as the map updates, you can see that, oh, Berlin kind of looks like the shapes of the blocks kind of remind us a little bit of Vienna, which is makes a little bit of sense, right? Because there's like some cultural sharing there from Holy Roman Empire and Prussia and, but also if we look over here, you can see that, you know, historically there's East and West Berlin. So West Berlin, more Western, kind of these larger tracks, this is a city that was really destroyed in World War II and had to get rebuilt. And so the way that it got rebuilt in the USSR, over here, you can see there's these really big, where the blocks, all the blocks were kind of continuous. Over here in Eastern Berlin, there's these big housing blocks. Look at how, look at this. This one is really, really famous. Look at that. That building goes for the entire block. One massive structure. Look at that, that is crazy. Isn't that intense? Look at how much park space is there too. So you can see that like different neighborhoods, even here without us jigsaw puzzling them together are different. And then if you look in here, here's areas that were totally completely obliterated and then the Berlin Wall moved through here. So in Potsdamer plots, wow, that roof is just bonkers. So if you guys wanted to start like pulling in, you guys know how to do screen prints, screen grabs. You could bring in, if you, if you, if you wanted to engineer a park, you could trace and draw out at your own park in AutoCAD, but we could also just draw over top of it. We could draw our own park, or you could snag a park. Like uh, if you really wanted to get into Leipziger plots because you were super interested in it, you could do that. Anybody been watching? Oh, anybody watching any good sci-fi lately? Have you guys watched uh, Warrior Nun at all on Netflix? It's both ridiculous and awesome. They... A, it's a really low budget. So instead of doing these ridiculous, um, fantastic set pieces, like they're doing in The Mandalorian, where they're using that LCD screen as the background, um, instead they had to go on site. So I've been looking up, um, I've been looking up like, oh, where was this actually shot? So for example, in, in Harry Potter, in Harry Potter, there's a bunch of things where they made a soundstage, like the... Um, when they go shopping for their wands, that's a set on a movie somewhere. But it's actually built, it's actually based on an actual street. And so I was looking this up because I was like, oh, this is really fascinating. Check it out. It's built up an actual street. This is the name of the street. It's called the Shambles and it's in York in the city in UK. Check that out, right? It looks like, what's it called, Diagon Alley? It looks like Diagon Alley. So they actually built it so they could do the movie there, but this is even better. So if you do this, you could say, oh, what does that look like? Check it out. It's a really tiny street, but look at all of the little pieces that are going into, you guys were talking about how like not all the streets line up. 
You could build this in if you wanted to. You could snag it and build it in. Oh, look at it. And there's a market right next to it. All right. Let's go back to Rome because I keep going there. But here's the bonus. I challenge you guys to try to bring in, but this is the challenge. Don't just pick a city. Pick a city that is, for some reason, important, significant, like you visited it, you have a familial connection to it, somebody in your family has a connection to it, because that will grow our conversation larger. And then we won't just have, we'll have a, an even better imaginary city. Okay, I'm gonna zoom into Rome. Have any of you guys been to that city? Okay, all right. I'm gonna zoom in to, check out, this is, um, you see this, and there's not a lot of straight streets in Rome, but this is one of them called Via del Corso. And we actually talked about this place earlier this semester, right? We talked about the Spanish stuff. So you guys remember talking about this? Way, way back. Hang on. We'll drop Stickman in there and we'll talk about it. So the Spanish steps, it's this big space right here. It looks like this, right? So we're in this big open piazza. We talked about it when we were starting to look at perspectives. We did, we totally did. And look at all the people hanging out and sitting on it, right? What, a, so this, the reason why I'm going here is because this is a world famous example of like a great public space that people just wanna chill, right? Like people just hang out here. Um, what kind of public spaces do you guys know of that exist on campus where people just like hang? In front of Canberra, this is the, Imagine this is like R in front of Canbar, but at a city scale. What's another place where people, where you guys witness people kind of like hanging out here? Raven Hill? Where in Raven Hill? Yep, yep, right? People love to watch people do stuff. Totally, the bleachers in Times Square, absolutely. The bleachers in Times Square are in part making a reference to this. Okay, so I'm gonna zoom out and go to 2D. And now I'm gonna, now since I'm screen sharing, I'm gonna turn on annotation. Now I want you guys to help me diagram what's going on in this space, all right? So first of all, you guys told me that we should do the building outlines. So I'm gonna do the building outlines here. But does that really tell us about the space? It's kind of limited, right? And like from in, from on the Spanish steps, I don't really know that there's a courtyard there. Right? So the building outlines is one thing. Give me some more things that I should draw. And I'm gonna draw them in, interestingly enough, AutoCAD and Zoom have the same color palette. What do we got? Where people are. Okay, so I'm gonna draw that with some shapes that are see-through. So there was people standing here you can see that there's a bunch of people around the fountain there, around this fountain here. I know that there's a subway stop, but if we zoom in a little bit more, we'll see people up here, up here, up here, over here, over here, a bunch of people in here, a bunch of people in here. Even though, even if you, even if you haven't been there, you can kind of see where the people are walking. I don't know whether you guys can see it, but there's lots of little tiny shadows. Hey, what else is a layer that we should be, where people are congregating? Who? Anna. Where there's traffic. Okay, but remember, if we draw the cars, then we'll just draw a city that's about cars. So let, let's let's take anything that's vehicle and let's be like, okay, but let's put it to the side, out. Yeah, well, in Rome, not so much, but yeah, let's use arrows to talk about where people are walking. Now, here's the thing, cities are amazing. Cities get to be really amazing when they are about people and when they're about traffic people tend to drive through them they don't exhibit a atlanta exhibit a exhibit b anything about philadelphia have you guys ever walked to the bottom right there's nothing about that that's a spatial experience that's 60 miles an hour there's no you're not interacting with the people around there you, there's no cultural exchange there's no stopping for pizza the only cultural exchange happens in the form of middle fingers. So let's draw where people are walking with arrows. Keep it coming, I'm getting bored. 
thresholds. Okay, uh, Alec, come up here and draw with your finger where the thresholds are. I'm gonna draw them in green. Walking in from here. Okay, hang on. Uh, here, gotcha. Oh yeah, totally threshold here. Oh yeah, yep, and in here. Do you think there's any like other hierarchies of threshold? Uh, I'm gonna say there's a threshold up here too, up the hill. Okay, thresholds, hang on, Alex, I want you. Thresholds, Andre. Thresholds. Tag somebody else. Yep. Yep. Oh, yeah. So there's like here and these. Yep. Thresholds. Okay. What else? What else? Andre, tag two people. So we got thresholds. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. So we might want to check out where we get some greenery. So let's get some, let's, let's do that with areas again. I'm going to do that here. So obviously, you know, in Rome, not tons of greenery out in here, just a little bit. That's about it. Okay. Diego spaces. Like, what do you mean by space? It's kind of very general. Let's get specific. Okay, some open spaces, open spaces. All right, so open space, open space, open space. There we go, open space. All right. What else? Tag Hannah, tag somebody, Diego, tag somebody. Open space, greenery. What? Monuments, we already got. Yeah, right. That's like a thing. We're we're after like, right? Because we're after. I, I could cut up a bunch of different places, but like, right? Being in Philly has a feeling. Being in Vienna has a feeling. Being in Rome has a feeling, and those feelings are more than just like what color they paint the houses, right? Yeah. Think back, think back, guys. Think back to what you did for the cultural corridors. What mattered the most to you when you were in those spaces? The key to this homework is remembering what you already learned and what was important to you. So it should be, it should be the things that, that shine out the loudest about what you remember drawing or diagramming or remember about walking around in those spaces. What do we got? Noise, noise. Sure, but it might be a different kind of threshold. So let's draw that as a different kind of threshold, like an exit, right? Things where you're splitting and then thing, and which is the opposite of things where you're kind of like coming together, right? Or like, ooh, compression and expansion. We talked about that a lot. We talked about that a lot in the cultural, cultural corridor spaces that you guys were at, right? Like going into Reading Terminal and then coming out into that, that big, crazy, big, rail dome that you're in right so ideas about compression and expansion that that cross connects with things that you guys are talking about with studio right now oh my gosh stuff you're doing in studio might inform stuff you're doing in biz let's do this all right uh, compression and expansion okay what else do we got what else do we got tagged narrow spaces which andre was starting to get at that already right with like this space that was happening in here right so you could diagram that as a layer in AutoCAD, even though it doesn't physically exist in the city as like a thing, you could exist, you could diagram the experience of like where there's areas of compression in your neighborhoods. Uh, let's tag some more people that we haven't heard from. Franny and Franny, you're gonna tell Diego and Diego's gonna scream it at us. All right, who else? Diego, tag somebody in. All right, the ladies in the back, the ladies in the back. Gracie, what do you think? I, 
I'm going to add one that you can't figure out from looking at a satellite view, which is elevation, whether things are moving up or down. So like that, you're going to have to kind of like look at and make an educated guess. Now, I know, I know that this goes up top, that this gets taller and taller and taller here. I know that that happens, right? Um, we're, of course, going to have to do that with like circles, I guess. You know, because in AutoCAD, we have lines, polylines, circles, and ellipses. So that's what we can do it with. We could also do, um, I suppose we could always do the draw lines here like this. Like we could draw arcs to get the flow. Right. Gracie, what do you think? I gave you guys some time so you could think up some, some stuff. What layers were important to you when we were diagramming the cultural corridors? What really stood out to you guys? Smell. Now, do we know how Rome smells? But we could imagine it, right? We could imagine it. What do you think, do you guys remember what was on those steps when we looked at them before, besides a bunch of people? What? Plants, what kind of plants? They were flowers. It was totally flowers. It was a bunch of like really, really bright flowers that were right down the middle of it. I bet those have a smell. Tim, what kind of what other kind of layers really like stood out to you when we were doing the diagramming of the cultural corridors? Views. Yeah, absolutely. So let me switch colors again. And let's do views. So there's a view here, and there's a view this way. There's a view looking up that way. There's a view down that street. There's a view down that street. Well, it looks like compression and expansion and thresholds actually have a relationship with each other. What else we got? Ooh, what? can you? Why should you? Sure. I mean, absolutely, right? Didn't you guys have to do your own path? You guys had to draw your own path where you went in the diagram? The more we drew that diagram, the better it got, right? And we turned the layers on and off. Cool stuff, huh? Yeah, definitely. How many layers do we got there? A bunch. Ooh, put path, put path. Oh, you even do like hot, sunny areas, hot areas. Like the neighborhoods that are uh, Oaxaca are warmer than the areas that are Vienna, right? The, the Vienna neighborhoods are gonna be uh, cooler, I think, than Oaxaca. Maybe not, because is Oaxaca is- It's an elevation. Ah, there you go. So the Philadelphia areas are gonna be hot and steamy. All right. Thank you. 
originally going to do, what I was originally going to do was, I'm going to stop. All right, so uh, hang on, I'm going to save an image of this, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And so I will be posting it so that if you have questions about the AutoCAD portion, it will be the first half of what I post to YouTube. And if you have questions about what we talked about in terms of what to do in terms of the homework, it'll be the last of what we did in YouTube, especially because this is the hardest part. Okay. So here are the layers in your console here. These are the new layers for AutoCAD. Um, zero is just gonna be the default layer. Def points is a non-fitting layer. Triple zero construction lines is just the orange one. And it's only for, only for, you know, the lines that you need to start to yourself organized. Zero one, building outline. Zero two, monuments. Zero three, neighborhoods. Zero five, density. All right, and then can you see what we've done? We've organized them and group them. So 20, the 20 layer, anything in the 20s has to do with views. Anything in the 30s has to deal with path. So 30 is path. 31, compression, 32, expansion, 35, exits or splitting, 36, threshold. Anything that's in the 40s is dealing with greenery. 41, shaded versus sunny, 42, hot versus cold. Anything in the 50s is dealing with open spaces. 55, narrow spaces. Anything in the 60s is dealing with noise, 61 is smell, and then anything in the 70s is elevation. So the reason why we started doing like that, rather than doing it in order to it allows us space. Like if we require more open space categories, hang with me for just a moment longer. If we want, if we want to start adding layers, let's say we come in and we realize we have a really big open spaces, layer 51, medium-sized open spaces, we can make it layer 52. So when you write down the layers, you need to write these numbers as the preface and then these names. Yep. Yeah, because I feel like there's going to be something else that goes in there. I started giving them numbers, but like this, this, it is not uncommon when I've done this assignment before for us to come up with 100, 200 different layers, and then we edit it down to about 20 layers. So right now we've got about 20 layers, but I think it's going to expand, and then we're going to edit. Eventually, we may get down to maybe 10 layers times. But for now, what I need you guys to do is to explore and draw plenty. Okay, one last, one last, one last question. One last question, Professor. I don't understand how much I need to draw. Okay, so what did we do? What did we do last week for Tuesday? What did you guys have to do? What was the key that what, to what you did? You sketched it out by hand on sketch on draft on paper, and it made it go so much faster, right? Okay, the cardinal mistake that you guys will make is opening up an AutoCAD late at night and just drawing digitally. Uh, Alec, can you throw me that for just a minute? How fast? Did you have, did you use those like, do you have like those Prismacolor markers? Yeah. So how fast is it to lay down some nice thick lines with those prisma color, right? How long does it take? How long does it take? Like two minutes, right? So guys, do yourself a favor. You got to work with this alongside, okay? So you can work a lot faster about say, organizing what thresholds are by using your existing skill set to draw by hand. Now, the thing about this is that you can draw fast. The thing about the AutoCAD is that you can draw more accurately. All right, so draw fast here. The, the fastest way to get this AutoCAD assignment done is to do it by hand first. Who worked on the homework together? Who worked on the homework together? Yeah, who worked on the homework together? Did it, how long did it take? Who worked late at night? Be honest, who worked late at night? It's so easy to work on it late at night, right, Sarah? Yeah. I recommend working on it together, at least for this part. It'll go a lot faster. And then you can watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine in the background while you save your stuff. See you guys on Tuesday with lots more AutoCAD.